So as I was telling you, um, I'm from Lemister. My name is Mark Bedanza. I'm the author of the book, uh, 10 Times a Champion, and um, the biography of Sam Jones. And it's an honor and privilege to be here with you folks, as well as to have written this book. Um, as I mentioned, I think, before we got busy here, um, I met Sam through Jojo White and actually appeared here a number of years ago with Jojo White and knew it was a great basketball town and decided it would be a good idea to come back. So you may ask yourself, like, you know, how, how do you get to write a book about Celtics like Jojo White and Sam Jones? And honestly, it was just pure coincidence. I can remember, like many of you, watching the uh, 76 finals and watching Jojo play in that triple overtime game and uh, thinking to myself, boy, that was a pretty dramatic piece of basketball. And then many years later, meeting Jojo and getting to know him and uh, having to pinch myself that that 20 year old that was watching that dramatic basketball got a chance to write his story. Um, when I first visited Sam in Florida, um, at his home, uh, I had mentioned to him that I knew a fellow, we had a mutual friend. Uh, my friend uh, is from the same hometown from Lemister. Uh, his name is Mike Bengrazi, wonderful guy, and a uh, real basketball warrior. We have a court in Lemister called the Bennett School Court and many many people have played there over the years it's one of those places where generations of young people have spent countless hours playing basketball and there's a real basketball culture there well his favorite basketball player of all time was Sam Jones and um, he had the honor and privilege of meeting Sam once when Sam came to Lemonster and it was a dream come true well, when, when you know, when you get to hear Sam, you'll know what kind of a wonderful, gracious man he is. And him and Mike became friends. So when I was in Florida, I mentioned to, to Sam that I came from the same town as Mike. And it, it didn't register immediately. And he said, Benny, that's his na nickname. And uh, I said, yeah, same town as Benny. And he, wrote, he rocked back in his chair and he had a hearty laugh. And, and uh, I knew right then and there from that moment that I was in a special place and, a, and had a special opportunity. And uh, today when I call Sam um, on the phone, instantly my mood elevates. It's just one of those type of people that um, not only was a great basketball player, but he's a great human being. So you've heard enough from me. You're better off hearing it from the horse's mouth. It's my honor to introduce Sam Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. But before I get started, there's a young man back there about my age, and I'm old. <laughs> and he's got on his cap. Now, this cap goes all the way back to the early 50s. E. E. Smith High School in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We started playing against each other in 1948 and 49. Wow. And he's here and he beat our butts. <laughs> <laughs> and I <laughs> he didn't get paid for it, I don't care. He still beat us and I thought we had the best team in North Carolina. <laughs> in the state. I really do believe that. But anyway, I played basketball all my life. And I've played all over the world. I've taught basketball in many, many countries. And I've never been nervous because basketball is my game. And so you don't get nervous. And when you make a mistake in basketball, it's not just your mistake, it's a team mistake. But when you get in front of an audience and there's nobody here but you, and you make a mistake, it's your mistake. <laughs> so I'm so nervous. I feel like a mosquito at a nudist camp. <laughs> I don't know where to start. <laughs> but truly, there are some things that you just can't believe. Number one, Red Auerbach never saw me play a game in college. Number two, I had never seen a professional basketball game in my life in person until I joined the Boston Celtics. And I did not know anyone. And the first day that we had practice, I never got a note in my, in my hotel room 
No one ever told me that we were having a meeting before we went to practice and I missed the practice. The worst thing to ever happen. Red Eye Back has a nasty mouth. <laughs> and I cannot tell you what he said to this rookie because it would be bad. <laughs> and I knew from that day, I better be on time every day. But when I joined this team, there were only 10 players on the team. Now, this is very funny. When you join a team that has just won your first world championship, are you going to cut anyone? Because you've been so successful that I got to keep all you people because you gave me my first world championship. Now here I am as a rookie trying to make this team. And so each day, Red Eye Back would call someone in, and the next day that person would be gone. And so we had about 12 rookies beside the team itself. And so in about 10 days, all the rookies was gone but me. Now, there are no veterans that has gone yet. Did you have a $100 bill sticking out of your pocket? I didn't even have $5 bills. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what happened is uh, he called me in and he said, uh, he looked at me and he pointed at me and he says, you are a problem. And I couldn't understand why he's saying this. And I'm wondering what have I done? And he says, you know, I got to cut someone in order to make room for you. And boy, I had a big relief that I knew I was going to be on this team. And I immediately said, Red, can I call my wife and let her know? And he says, yes. And I called my wife. I said, you can come to Boston. I'm on the team. And we came to Boston. I made the team. Well, Lou Gehrig said years ago, the greatest thing to ever happen to him is to play for the New York Yankees. The greatest thing that ever happened to me is to play for the world champion Boston Celtics. And this feels real good. Uh, the only rookie on the team, we go out and we play, but we're in New York, and I love Madison Square Garden, and they call it the only rookie on the Boston Celtics world champion, Sam Jones, and the lights are out. And I, and, and I come on the floor and I got a certain place to stand. They introduced all the Celtics, and then they introduced the Knicks, and I heard this huge roar. And I mean, it just sounded like it was vibrating all over New York City. I'd never seen this. I hadn't seen the people yet. It's dark. And as soon as they turn on the lights, I saw these people, I almost wet my pants. <laughs> this is the truth. I was so nervous. I didn't know what to do. When Red Eye Back put me in the game with all these people, I got in the game, I played for about eight minutes, and Bill Russell, the greatest player I think in the world because of what he did and what he accomplished, Bill Russell came over to me and he says, I'm not gonna call you Sam Jones, I'm gonna call you right back. I said, what do you mean right back? He said, well, every time we pass you the ball tonight, you pass it right back. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I did that, I think I did that because I was so nervous. This is the truth. I was, I, I didn't feel right playing on the floor and looking at all these people and I did not want to mess up. And so my coach got to me, he says, listen, I didn't bring you in here to pass the ball. I brought you in here to shoot the ball. And so when Kuzi gives you the ball, you've got to shoot it. So we're now, we're in a regular season. I'm coming down the court, Kuzi gives me the ball. I go up to shoot my shot. And Tommy Heinsohn, now you may know Tommy Heinsohn, he's been with the Celtics all his life. Tommy Heinsohn went to the basket. No one is on him. I passed him the ball. He makes a layup. Two minutes later, Red Eye back takes me out of the game. He grabs my shirt and says, sit right here. And the game is going on and I'm, I'm watching the game and he's watching the game and he said, did you shoot the ball? Now he's, he's right here. I'm right here, he's, and he's not looking at me. He said, did you shoot the ball? I said, no. He says, why? I said, coach, Tommy Heinsohn was open. 100% he's going to make the layup 
50% I'm going to make the shot. He says, that's not the bleeping question I ask you. <laughs> Did you shoot the ball? So I said, no. He said, that's why you're the bitch. Now, I couldn't understand this because we play as a team. This is team basketball. You hit the open man. Three minutes later, he puts me right back in the game in the first three plays that are called on my play. They're testing me to see if I'm going to shoot it. Yes, I shot it. I don't know if I made them or not, but I shot them. We go down, we go down, <laughs> we go down to Philadelphia. I go in the game. I replace Bill Sharman, who's a great shooter. Cousy gets trapped at half court. I got to come out from the side, get the ball at half court. Cousy passing half court, I turn around, I shot the ball. I didn't hit anything. <laughs> and I saw Red back just come up off the bench. But it didn't bother me. And we made a run and they call a timeout. We come over to the sidelines. The Celtics never sat. We always stood. The, the, the guys who were not in the game, they came up and stood around us. And Red is just looking at me and his eyes are just piercing me. And I'm looking over his head like I'm looking him in the eye. And he didn't say a word. And all of a sudden, we get ready to go back on the court. He grabs my shirt and he says, what kind of shot was that, Sam Jones? I said, coach, when Kuzi gives me the ball, I shoot it. He <laughs> never said another word, <laughs> not at all. So. so <laughs> So when you talk about team basketball, sometimes the coach wants you to be a little bit selfish. And I did not understand that because I was brought up to play team basketball. And the Celtics was coached so well by Red Auerbach. I can tell you this. You see these coaches today, they got a pad and they're writing down stuff. And I'm saying to myself, that must be a dumb team. You practice, let me tell you something. Through your practice, you get all the plays. All the plays. My play, I knew by heart. My play was the one, the one R, which meant the one reverse, the one C, which meant the one cut, the two, which mean the big man, small man, the 20 meant outside, the 21 meant inside, the four and the 44, they're all my plays. I got a lot of plays. Now, if you came to play with the Celtics and you played my position, Red Auerbach didn't teach you. I teach you. I'm your teacher. If you didn't learn the plays, it's my fault. But we're not jealous. I want you to be as good, if not better, just in case I get hurt. That because the idea is to win. And so we took you through the plays for six times. We call them, every play that I run for you, we call them one, two, three, four, five. We go alphabetically or numerical down the line. But the third time, we call different plays. We'll say run the 44, run the 20, run the one. You got to know how to execute. And everybody else got to know how to execute. Now in football, what happens? Quarterback comes to the line. He gets down on the ball. He looks at the defense. He's got time to change. That's an audible. Change. We only have 24 seconds. By the time we start running our plays, it's 15 seconds. The defense dictate what we do. So we don't have any audibles. We have to watch the defense and everybody knows what to do. Now, why do you think they have a book for, play, for players now. I'm looking at you. <laughs> why do you think they have a book for players now? Why, yeah, why, why, why does he have to write down and say, well, we're going to run this play? Yeah. Why? Not why do you need to write it down? I just taught you that you didn't need it. <laughs> why do you think they do it? I mean, not just every coach in the NBA has a book that they write down for these plays. You, you talk these plays in practice before you even start the season. Are they that dumb? <laughs> I said, you know what I said? When I played, 
everybody had a degree from college. <laughs> so we were, more, we were much smarter than they were. So we didn't need the book. But those are some of the things that, that does happen. I remember, <laughs> just, I love this, Red Auerbach told me one night, he said, Sam Jones, you got Jerry West. Jerry West averaged 30 points a ball game. Now, all I can do is think about Jerry West, and I got to play Jerry West. So we get on the court, and we're ready to play the jump ball. I went to Casey, I said, Casey, you got Jerry West. <laughs> <laughs> at, 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 at halftime, Jerry West had 18 points, about three rebounds and three assists. And we go in the back, and Red Auerbach said, Sam, I thought I told you you had Jerry West. I said, no, coach, it's that other Jones boy. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, he didn't remember that. But at the end of the game, he asked me to stay after everybody had left. And he says, I really need to talk to you. He says, I don't think I'm losing it. But did I not tell you you had Jerry West? I said, coach, you did. Well, why in the hell did, oh, excuse me, you gotta, excuse me. <laughs> well, why didn't you take him? I says, coach, Case is a better defensive player than I am. Why should I take him? I'm a shooter. You think I'm gonna waste my time playing defense? I need to shoot. So he just let it go. The same thing with Oscar Robinson, averaging 30 points a ball game. I put Casey on him every night. <laughs> you know, longevity is have his privilege. And so those are some of the things that those are some of the things that we do. We have fun, but we want to win. And I think the reason that we won is because of our coach. Red Auerbach was a taskmaster. I think that we were in better shape than anybody, including Hockey, baseball, football, or what you want to do. We were in great shape, and we wanted to be the best during the whole season. So if we could stay healthy, we could play. My first year, we went all the way to the finals. We went six games, but Russell got hurt, and so we lost. And then from 58 through 66, we won eight straight world championships. And when I left, I had 10 championships. So usually I really, you know, I, I really like to strut my stuff. I'm very humble. <laughs> but I like to strut my stuff. When they reintroduce Sam Jones, I do like this. <laughs> do you know what that is? Ten That's 10 rings. <laughs> yes, indeed, I do like this. Because I didn't do it myself, okay? We did it as a team. When I went into the Hall of Fame, the first thing I said, I'm going into the Hall of Fame, there'll be a lot of Celtics who may never make the Hall of Fame. Lou Sharopoulos, Jim Luskatov, they never made the Hall of Fame, but they contributed to everybody in the Celtics who went into the Hall of Fame. So I, th I said, listen, I accepted my ring because of the fact that the whole team, for those who may not ever make it, I don't wear the rings. I got the championship ring. That's the greatest championship ring in the world. I was married to my wife for 60 years and six months and 15 days before she passed. And I will never forget that lady because she made me. We came to the Celtics together. Now, let's open up for questions. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, I remember the words completely unbiased, totally objective Celtic announcer, Johnny Most. <laughs> all right, and uh, his words were, Havlicek steals it over to Sam Jones. Uh, could you describe that moment for us? Could I describe it? Yeah, from your perspective. Oh, and by the way, is Bob Cousy really 90 years old? He is 90 years old. I called him one day before his 90th birthday, and he told me you're one day early. <laughs> But he, and right now he is in Worcester. He comes back every summer and he, he stays in Worcester. But his home in the winter is in uh, Palm Beach Gardens in Florida. Now I'm gonna describe what you said. 
He never stole the ball. He actually deflected the ball. That's what happened. But I, Johnny Most had it a different way. <laughs> but it was all right with me. Now, what people, what people don't know is that many of our players had fouled out. And they need to see where I am. I am actually playing a person who's 6'10". And I thought that person was going to get the ball. And they could have called a foul on me, but we only had two officials. So we know one has got to be watching the ball and the other's got to be watching a whole lot of other people. And so I got this big guy and I'm actually holding him. And so when Havlicek deflected the ball, when I turned, the ball is in the middle of the floor. And it's, it's just there and anybody can get the ball. But I'm pretty quick. And so I took off and I got the ball, dribbled to the right side of the line, and I passed it to Havlicek. And I always say, Havlicek, you're stupid. He threw the ball away. <laughs> the guy who caught the ball was named Mark Slopman. He sold the ball for $50,000. <laughs> Good gracious, I wish I had known. <laughs> My gracious, yes. You belittle yourself a little when you say defense was Casey was probably the greatest defensive guy ever. He could push people, make them wet, go where they wanted. But you had the slick hands, you had those quick hands out front. I see you steal balls more times. But I don't mind telling the truth. Case was a better defensive player. That's why I put it, that's why I put it on Oscar. That's why I put him on Jerry. Right, but I'm just saying, you belittle yourself by saying you probably, you were I played, I just, I, I was good, but I wasn't as good as Casey. Oh. I don't mind, and I couldn't, I couldn't play as well. I had to, in order to play Oscar and Jerry, I had to almost match them in points. You understand, in which I'm not going to do it because our game is different. I'm not going to do it anyway. But I'm going to get you 20 points. I'm going to get you 17 points. I'll be somewhere in that area. Oh, you played oh I played. I thought I played well. <laughs> you should be my agent. <laughs> yes, I'll get you next. Yes. It was my forte. When you go out to warm up, everybody, every player, they make layups. Left-handed, right-handed, where is it? It's off the backboard. We did not miss in high school because our coach did it. But when you go down the center, you had to shoot for the rim. Now, if you're not missing, like one day I just thought, maybe I should shoot for the backboard. Now, back in our day, you can attest to this, we didn't have any glass. It was all wood, but we were lucky. We didn't have those funny oval-shaped boards. We had rectangular backboards. And so I put a piece of tape up there <laughs> on both sides where I could hit the tape. You don't look at the basket. You look at the tape. And I started shooting very closely in, just standing here, tape. Now, when I got further back, I started the jump shot. And so I would hit that tape and just kiss off that board. It's just like holding your girlfriend, <laughs> nice and easy. And I would shoot that from both sides. And I would shoot at least 50 shots each day from each side of the court. And it, it became my shot. Now, when I get to the pros, nobody has seen this shot. And they say, Sam Jones is the greatest shooter off the backboard. You doggone right. Nobody else shoots it. <laughs> so I got to be, but John Wooden, who was the winningest coach in college basketball as far as championships are concerned, Final Fours. All of his kids had to practice off the backboard. And so you have to teach it. And it, I, 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 I'm sorry to say, we in America now, we don't know fundamentals. We, all they want to see is between the legs, behind the back, and a dunk. But we still have to teach our kids fundamentals. You better watch out because the Europeans play the game the way it should be played. And we have a lot of European players that are coming over here in the NBA that's playing. You go next. I, I started watching, listening to you when I was out of the Navy in 1960. Uh, 
uh, we came back to Panama, we didn't have any money, so we listened on the radio, and the thing we listened to would be the Celtics. And we came to love St. Jones, and we never saw you play until like three years later, we were able to get a television. We could not wait to see what you looked like. Oh my gosh, what you miss? <laughs> <laughs> But, but we couldn't wait to see what, what you look like in there. What does this man look like? Because every time that, that the Celtics played, when it was crunch time, we, we both, my wife and I are both yelling, get Sam Jones the ball, get Sam Jones the ball. And, and of course, when, when you got the ball, you put it in the basket. So before I came tonight, my wife wanted to come too. And I said, what, what, do, what should I say to Sam Jones when I, when I get a chance to say hello? And she said, tell him I love him. And thank you so much for all the great memories you gave. I haven't seen your wife, but I love her too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You know, that's the last thing. I have five kids and 14 grandkids, eight boys and six girls. And the one thing that we do when we end, we don't do, I don't do any texting. I hate it because I want to hear voices. And the last thing that we do is we say, I love you. That's the way we end it because I may not be here tomorrow. And in the mornings, if we're talking, before they left for school, it was, I love you, because you never know what's going to happen. And that's, that's one of the things that my wife and I taught our kids. It is, it's tough to teach a young, a young man, a kid who's 16 and 70, boy, you tell his mother, I love you, but he doesn't like to say it to his father. But we, and I had a grandson, my last, my youngest grandson, I said, I love you, Dylan. He said, me too. <laughs> You know I had to change that. I said, I said it's not me too, Dylan. It's, it's, it's I love you. So we got it. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. You got the wrong number on. Whose number, whose number is that? Um, He's good. <laughs> you're, you're all right. You can ask your question. Um, do you remember Johnny Egan? Who's that? Johnny Egan. You know I do. He's living in Houston. He's a great player. He played for Providence. How do you know Johnny Egan? And he's my uncle. Really? Yeah, he's a great player by all means. Good guard. He also played for the Lakers, too. Yes? Sam, thank you so much for coming out to Chelsea. We really appreciate it. And I had many, many great years uh, watching you and the Celtics play in the early days. The question I have for you, is could you share with us a little bit about the chemistry between uh, yourself and Red and Bill? Oh, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> that is not, uh, I, I don't even like, why would you come up with that question? <laughs> okay, it's, it's halftime. We're up 15 points. I got Russell, we had the worst dressing rooms in the world. I could tell you something. My college, my high school dressing room was better than the Celtics the first three years. But we got Russell, and I put Havlicek between Russell and I, because I used to sit beside Russell. They, Larry Siegfried, going around the room. Well, at halftime, we're leading by 15 points. But we're not playing the way Red wants us to play. And I mean, he gets very, very angry. And you hear the stuff, what happens in Vegas, it stays in Vegas. Well, that's the same thing with the Celtics dressing room. So he would start at Havlicek. And we're going clockwise now. I always grab my towel, even though we're up 15 points. And I'd put it over my face. He get on Havlicek, then me, Siegfried, Seth Sanders. Tommy Hankson was his beating boy. I love Tommy because he beat on Tommy all the time. But when he got to Russell, he says, it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> Never said a word. The next game, he reversed the order. He went counterclockwise. But he didn't start at Russell, he started over here. Got all the way, got to Havlicek. As soon as he finished with Havlicek, it's time to go. Because he got Russell next. And it really bothered me. Why did he say anything bad about Russell? But I don't want to question my coach because we're winning. When I retired, I went to him and I said, Red, yeah, I said, I want to tell you something. I didn't think it was right for you to talk about all your players 
but you never said anything bad about Russell. He says, let me tell you something. I never won a championship until Russell came. And when Russell came, I won all those championships. Do you think I was going to make him angry? <laughs> and I could understand that. But at least he should have one time just blessed him out, even if he didn't mean it, to make us feel good. Because I used to tell Habitat, I said, can you believe what he said? Russell's a part of this team. And that's, that's, that, those are my feelings. I, don't ever ask me that question again. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Um, first of all, it's great to meet you. Thank you. I've um, been a big fan of for a long time. And one of the things that I think since I became interested in professional basketball as a young kid in the 60s was, as you look back now, 50 years later, maybe whatever it's been, there's always been these different eras. And you look at the players today, the, the Currys and the LeBrons, and you look at the Jordans and the Magics and the, and the uh, Birds, and you keep going down the line until you get to the era that you played in. I'm just wondering, what, what are your one or two major thoughts about the differences in what we see today and what we saw in, in your era? Well, the big difference is they can travel anytime they want to. Anytime. They have their own planes. And they don't have to worry about getting up and we never flew first class. Never. We flew with the passengers. And, and, and the thing is, when they get on that place, they got food waiting on them. And I mean, it's, it's gourmet. The other thing, I got to tell you this. When I first came to the Celtics, we got $8 a day meal money. I go down to New York, I order bacon, eggs, coffee, and toast. It was $17. And I told the lady, I can only give you a dollar tip because I've all spent all my meal money. <laughs> so there were certain places that we could not eat right. We had to go out and eat. So I didn't know about the hotels. And so we, we sort of got to red. The next, the next time it went up to $10, which was not enough money. But let's go ahead. And I'm going to get back. You'll get back. Let's go ahead. I'm scouting for the Celtics. And I'm at training camp, and they're getting ready to go on a 10-day road trip. But the 10 days to play, but really it was a 20-day road trip. So I said, uh, they asked me, if, would you like to go? They were going to San Antonio. They were going to Dallas. Uh, they were going to Phoenix. And then they were going to come back to Houston. And they had one more game to play. But we had, it was like 20 days on the road. And so I said, I don't want to go. I want to go back home. And they said, well, you get $80 a day meal money. I said, I think I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I can count 20 days and $80 a day is $1,600. So in Houston, I'm getting ready to go to breakfast to eat. And they says, oh, no, no, no. There's a meeting with the coaches. I go where the coaches are, there's all this food. I spend no money. At lunchtime, we're watching film. There's all this food, I have no money. I don't have to worry about eating. After the game, we get on the plane to travel, there's all this food, I mean, it's gourmet food. So now, I have not spent any money. I get back home, and I gave my wife $500. And I said, I got $800 from the team. I didn't tell about the rest of the money. <laughs> no, but the difference is this. My first three years with the Celtics, we did not have a trainer. We had to help each other tape. We did not have personal trainers. We had one shower. One shower. My first year, I was a rookie, so I had to do it last. It was the pecking order. Cousy was there first, so he was the first to take the shower, and it went down to that order. Thank God the water did not get cold. <laughs> and we had one whirlpool, just one, but no trainers. We had to learn to do this ourselves. And when we moved to another place, we had five showers, we had 
three, three taping tables. We had, a, we had a trainer. But these guys now travel with their personal trainers. They let them fly with them. It doesn't make any difference. They, they, they got the best equipment. Did anybody read about this new building that the Celtics have? They got a place they can take a nap after practice. This is unbelievable. I, 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 could, I could have played for 15 years if you had something like that. Gosh. Yeah, they make it very easy for them. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, what was it like to run a fast break with Celtics? Well, it was great if I had Satch Sanders on the other end, uh, on the lane on the other side, because I knew Kuzi was not going to pass in the ball. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm running with Heinzen, and I'm running with Havlicek or Bill Sharman, any one of us can get the ball. So, yeah, when you got, you, you always watch who's on the other side. Because now, you, it's, if you got good shooters, any one of us can get the ball. It's up to Kuzi where he's, when he sees the open man. And so that's, that's how we play. Oh yeah, Casey's gonna pass me the ball anyway. We're Joneses. <laughs> Are you kidding me? He better pass the ball to me. Yes. What do you think of the current Celtics team and of Brad Stevens as their coach? I love Brad Stevens. I think he's a wonderful coach and he's done a tremendous job. The thing about the Celtics, and, and, and we lost two good players in the playoffs that we could have done much better had we had them. The thing is, in any sport, you've got to stay healthy. And when someone goes down, it really mess, it messes up the order that you want to play your games. Now this year, I just, I just, read, I just heard something bad already uh, about this kid. Uh, that's terrible. And we got this other kid that we just signed from Texas, A&M or Texas. He's, and, and they said he's got some problems. So hopefully the players can get together and straighten that out because if he can play, and with LeBron James going to the Lakers, we should win the East. But we got Philadelphia to worry about. That is a good team. And I think that if we can play the way we're supposed to play with the personnel that we have, we should be in the finals next year. And that providing we stay healthy. Especially with this coach. Yes, he's a great coach. Larry Bird once said that the uh, greatest teammate he had that he played with was the late great Dennis Johnson. And he also said the defensive player that gave him the most trouble was Michael Cooper. Uh, who are these people for you? Michael Cooper? He was who, who was he, the greatest player you played with and the one on defense that gave you the most trouble? Nobody gave me trouble on defense. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. You see, you see this, I love this. I don't say that to be bragging, okay? I told you about every play that we have. Every play that we run, I know that I'm going to be free just by the way we execute. And that's why I say we can run plays until you make the adjustment. It's just like Bill Bradley. Bill Bradley comes into the league, you know, he had already. He's, he's a Rhodes Scholar. He had already, he missed a year. And he's coming into the league and they've given him all this play. So we go down to New York. We told Havlicek, the first four plays we calling for you. We're going to see how good Mr. Bradley is. Havlicek had three out of four. He scored. And Bill is walking up the court. He says, don't you guys ever shoot? I said, Bill, he's made three, three out of four. I says, when you get used to the play on this side, we're going to run it on the other side. <laughs> and we will do that. And, and so we don't worry about, he's filming me. We've never, looked at a, we've never looked at a film the whole time I played. Because we know what we need to do to win. And we're not going to worry about you because we're, back in my day, we played Philadelphia eight times because there were only eight teams. And so four and four, that you get, that's a rivalry. It's same with New York. And then we go out and we play the Lakers two and two. 
that's, that's, that, you get to be a rivalry when you start playing with guys like Elgin Baylor and Jerry West and those guys. Michael Cooper was a great defensive player by all means. And I could understand what Bird has said. And he was a little bit shorter than Bird. Michael was about six, seven, but he was quick, had long arms and could run like a gazelle. So I could understand that. But the team that Bird and them had, they should have won six or seven championships. He doesn't like for me to say that, but I do because I thought they had the best team. But they also had to go up against Jabbar and Magic and Worthy, which also in the West had a great team. And I saw a hand back there and I'll get you next. Yes. Uh, first, again, thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, the comments about the bank shop was one of my questions, so I often wonder that. I coached and taught my kids how to do that. But my question deals with Bill Russell. <coughs> when I was a boy, I went to Bill Sharman's camp, and Russell came in to lecture. And I, to this day, remember he talked about defense being more psychological, and he talked about he would get his foot one exactly where Chamberlain wanted to plant his foot for the pivot just to throw him off that much. I mean, he was so intelligent. Do you have any stories about Russell? Oh, I have great stories about Russell. Yeah, well, I, 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 yeah, Russell took case. We don't call timeouts. Red Auerbach called times out. So one night, Russell called a timeout. And we didn't even know what was happening. We were playing <laughs> Philadelphia. And Red Auerbach is angry because all the times out is Red Auerbach. So we're going to the sideline, and Red says, what is wrong with you? He says, I want Case and Sam Jones out of the game right now. And Red said, no way. He says, you got to get them out right now. So <laughs> I'm looking at him, why is he doing this to us? And so Red said, why? He says, I got Chamberlain just where I want him. And they make it, well, they're making, he's making Chamberlain mad and he's going to score 100 points. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Red, Red just told us, don't go near Russell or Chamberlain. Because we used to agitate, we like to agitate Chamberlain. I just love to agitate him. I don't run by and just hit him. But not to hurt him, but it's called agitating. It's like Jerry West. Jerry West is wounded right here. He's got red marks all over him. You see, we only had two officials. Now, if you have any officials in here, you know when you go up to shoot the ball, if he's right-handed, your left hand goes up, right? Well, where, where are the officials? That's right. Where are the officials looking? They're looking up here, but they're not looking down here. <laughs> so he had a lot of red marks down here. And that's what, that's what you do. You had a question. Yeah, regarding Will Chamberlain. Uh, didn't you use to tease him with your shot? Yes, I did tease him. But I said too late. Yes. <laughs> but you see, I knew when to say it. Right. And I knew when to shoot it. You see, I don't challenge people who block shots. Okay. I know where I am, and I know what I'm capable of doing. Well, when he's coming after me, and I know I can get the shot over his head, I got him so when I let that ball go, I said, too late, Will. And he didn't like that at all. <laughs> but that's the only one I did that to. Yes. Yes. How big was your rivalry with the Lakers? What was that? How big was your rivalry, rivalry with the Lakers and Philadelphia? How big? How big was your rivalry with the Lakers? Oh, real big. <laughs> Those are the two best teams in the league. And when you get those, those type of players, I, I truly thought that Philadelphia had a better team, but we were good because it's only one ball. See, they had a lot of shooters, but you could only, only one man can shoot at a time. And when they had Hal Greer and Billy Cunningham and Chet Walker and Luke Jackson and Wilt Chamberlain, and uh, I'm trying to think of uh, who was the guy came from Syracuse, he coached Chicago. Big Red, they called him. That's who I had, Johnny Kerr. That's who I was playing, that's the 6'10 guy. That's who I was playing when Havlicek stole the ball. 
Uh, and I couldn't think of his name, but uh, they had a good team. And they were just tough to reckon with. And then we had a little guy, real little guy. Nice. No, you don't have to be big to play uh, basketball. But if you like the Lakers, they had a little guy named Gail Goodrich. Gail Goodrich, when he came into the game, we put Havlicek in the game because we needed to get Gail Goodrich out of the game. That's how good he was and how quick he was. And we knew that if we could get him on the bench, we don't mind Jerry West. Jerry West going to get his points. But we don't want Gail Goodrich getting 15 points. So we put Havlicek in the game, and he can't match up with me, and he can't match up with Havlicek. So they had to take him out of the game. And Dallas said, we felt, we felt a relief because that guy was good. Yes. Yeah, he also played with John Wooden. He was good. Anyone else? Are we finished? One Looks question. Like Convention Hall in Philadelphia. Isn't that a real mistake to play in? But you like that. Yeah. It, but it was better than Villanova. Villanova is just like playing right here with all the fans here. But Convention Hall was a great place to play. In the, no, no, not really on top of the court, but they didn't hold that many people. Mm -hmm. But it was good. I, I love Convention Hall. I hated, I hated to play at Villanova because that court was right there. And it, it was tough to beat in Philadelphia there. Yes. Yes. Thank you for being here. I got another question. Yeah. Um, who was the guy that cut so you could join the Celtics? <laughs> Who's got it? What? Who's got cut so you could join the Celtics? He, you know, this is funny. I'm gonna tell you the truth. Red Eye back got me because of a coach in North Carolina. This coach was named Bones McKinney. And Bones coached at Wake Forest University. In 1957, Red Eye back called Bones McKinney, and he says who is the best player in the state of North Carolina? Like I said, they had no scouts there. So they realized on other people, the coaches, and they called, says, who is the best player in North Carolina? So Bones McKinney said, Sam Jones. And Red said, who? <laughs> Hung up the phone, this is what I heard. And now in 1957, there's something great that happened in North Carolina. The University of North Carolina beat Kansas in triple overtime for the NCAA tournament. They went 32 and 0. And they had a player by the name of Lenny Rosenbluth, who was an All-American. They had a fellow by the name of Quinn and Brennan, who could have been All-Americans. And so Red called two weeks later, and he says, you got North Carolina State, you got Duke, you got Wake Forest, and you got University of North Carolina. Who is the best player? And Bone said, Sam Jones. My school was never mentioned. So Bone said, Sam Jones. So they drafted me the first time ever. They ever drafted a Division II. The first time they ever drafted an African-American on the first round. And so they took me. But what you don't know, I had already been drafted before I went back to college. But when I went back to college, my name went back in the hat. Guess who drafted me? The Lakers. Oh. Yo, yes. No, but I was in the service. Yeah. I played against people that had played in the NBA that I did not even know they played in the NBA. One was Frank Ramsey, yeah. who I played with for seven years with the, with the uh, Celtics. One was Bobby Leonard, they call him Slick Leonard, who went to Indiana University, All-American, played for the Lakers. Al Bianchi, who played for Syracuse in Philadelphia. And anybody ever heard of Frank Selvey? Anybody know anything about Frank Selvey? What did he do that was great? What did he do that was great? Well, one, he missed that shot. <laughs> and I mean, he should have made the shot, but one thing that Frank Selvey did he went to Furman University in South Carolina. He scored 100 points in a ball game. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He scored 100 points in a ball game. Who were they playing against? No, no, no. And this guy could shoot now. 
that he was a shooter. But they, and Furman had good tees back in those days. It's not too far from Clemson. But uh, Frank was good. And Frank is the one who missed a shot that should have won the game for the Lakers. But so anyway, we're in the service. And we're playing basketball. And so I, I was the MVP of the tournament. So Bobby Leonard said, listen, would you like to play professional basketball? I never heard about professional basketball. Didn't even, didn't even, I knew one guy at that particular time, never saw him play. And that was George Mikan, playing with the Lakers, because he was the marquee for the NBA. John Cullen was a coach of the Lakers. So he drafted me while I was in service. Well, I had one more year to go to college. So I said, I'm going back to school. I wrote him a letter that says, I'm going back to school. And if you're interested, draft me next year. I had a good year. I scored 17 points that year. I was second in rebounds on my team. We went all the way to the finals and lost. But uh, what happened is they wanted another player. And so they traded with Cincinnati, the Royals then. The Royals picked Hot Rod Hundley on the first round and sent him to the Lakers. I was going to be drafted by the Lakers on the second round. I didn't know what rounds were. So it didn't make any difference to me. But before I could be drafted on the second round, the Celtics chose me number one. Okay. The, the guy that. The you guy got that one got more cut. question. <laughs> What's that? How did it feel to get drafted? At that time, awful. Because you didn't want to, I told you, I didn't want to get drafted by the Celtics. That's number one because they just won their world's championship. I would have never played basketball. I wanted to be a coach and I wanted to teach, and I wanted to teach students. And I had this job. Now, you, you, you can't relate to this, okay? You're too young. I had this job at $5,000 back in 57. That's a lot of money. In 57, you know, that's middle class. But they wanted me to coach in high school, so I'm holding out for this stipend. And I only wanted $500 more. And you, you know how we talk, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, mm -hmm. because this you have the job. And I'm thinking about the Celtics not cutting anyone who had just won their first world's championship. So I'm gonna be a teacher. And I talked to the principal, and as we were speaking, he knew I wanted this extra $500. He says, I just don't have it in my budget. And so I said, well, I thank you very much. So I went to the Celtics. <laughs> he said, that changed the course of history. At least your history, right. So, yes, sir. Thank you for being here. Thank I've you. been a lifelong Celtics fan. And did you have another question? Anybody else? I just uh, want to know if you have had that free stool bench Bronze or not? The one uh, that Will Chamberlain was... Why do you ask that question in front of all these people? <laughs> do you know anything about a stool? Well, I, I, that was, I was trying to save my life. That's right. I, 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 I actually... Will, Cha Will Chamberlain is my best friend. Really. Nice guy. Yeah, he's really one of my best friends. But you're not my friend when you wear a different color uniform on the court. I, I don't have any friends on the court except those guys who I play with. And so we play differently. When my man gets by me, I don't worry about him because I know Russell's going to come out and help. Well, my idea is to go back to Chamberlain and hopefully switch with Heinsohn or, or Havlicek or someone because they're taller than I am, and they will take Chamberlain. Well, we didn't have time, and I saw Chamberlain reaching for the ball like this, and all of this was exposed. And so I'm coming back to Chamberlain. I said, okay, I got you, brother. And I hit him. Oh, man, did I hit him. And so we don't have any paddings. And I heard him go, mm. And when I turned around, he was reaching for me. And there's a guy on the stool taking, he's a photographer. I knocked him off that stool. And I grabbed that stool, and I put it back here, <coughs> and he stopped. That, by that time, Russell and Luskatov was there, thank God. And he says, I'm going to make you eat that stool. 
And I says, I'm going to break your kneecaps. <laughs> the next day, we are in Philadelphia. See, that's what people don't know. The next day, we're in Philadelphia. Who picks me up for my pregame meal? Will Chamberlain. I go to his mom's house. She's got the greatest meal in the world. And she says, Sam, were you going to hit my kid? <laughs> and I said, Mr. Chamberlain, I was going to break his kneecaps. Because see, I, I thought he was going to kill me if he caught me. <laughs> the food was delicious. <laughs> we get back. And you know that night when you go into court, you, you get introduced. Well, this is the first time I ever got booed. Oh. And I'm the first one to go, I got booed because I, I hit Chamberlain. Oh, oh yeah. So they, they called my name, Sam Jones at guard. And you got to run on the court. I ran out like this. Oh, yeah, I, we're number one. And why, why they booed, I didn't care. They booed the whole time I stood there. They, make me, they introduced our team, and I still kept it up. And then they introduced Philadelphia, and then we'd go to shake hands. So as I shook Chamberlain's hand, he says, don't come into the paint tonight. <laughs> That's a challenge. You gonna tell me what not to do? So I told, I told Kuz, I said, Kuz, run my two play. So that's what Russell and me, that's where you get little man, big man. So I go around and I look at Chamberlain. He doesn't move. So I take one more dribble, I shot and made it. So if I made it, we're gonna run the two play again. So we call the two play again, I go around and he went diagonal, but he didn't go quick enough. I said, I got this all the way. So I went in and I got to right here and the ball disappeared. The ball went one way, my body went that way. <laughs> he hit me so hard, and I'm on the floor. <laughs> well, I do have tears in my eyes, but you're not going to. And my trainer come running out, and he says, are you hurt? I says, I think I'm dead. <laughs> I'm, I'm, really, I'm really hurting. He got me good. It's payback. I, I can understand that. So Chamberlain came down, and he knelt down. He says, you all right? And I said, yeah. He says, are you coming back into the paint? <laughs> <laughs> He's whispering this in my ear. I didn't say a word. I was so angry, I didn't know what to do. So, so I get to the free throw line, I'm really hurting, and I make both free throws. But on the second free throw, Red Auerbach says, run that play again. <laughs> and I said, coach, not tonight. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, no more. But that was, that was the get back. And I could understand that. So I, I, I didn't feel bad about it. Why do you think it's so hard today? Celtics always played team basketball. There was no high in the word team. Everybody knows that. But there's me. There is me. Nobody ever says that. Why? T-E-A-M. So there is M-E in there, right? But why is it so many teams have good players because one person has to score his 30, 40, 50 points and won't pass the ball. They never really attain the level that- Well, they don't really have to do that. Uh, let's take Don Nelson, for instance. Don Nelson couldn't shoot with the Lakers because it was for Jerry West and Elgin Baylor. But when he came with us, you got to shoot. And so we passed the ball to the open person. And you better shoot because it's just like me. Because if I pass the ball to you and you got a good shot, don't shoot it. I'm not passing to you anymore. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not the one who get assists. They're not going to give me assists. I'm supposed to make baskets. And so that's the difference. You really don't have to. I could have scored 30 points a ball game. But that's not the norm the way we play. We have to play to get the ball to the open man. And now when it comes to crunch time, Everybody knows that some people on the court, if they don't get free under the basket, they're not going to shoot it, like Satch Sanders. And Satch's a pretty good shooter. He's not going to shoot it. He's going to get the ball back out. And Case is not going to shoot it. So we know that. And that's the way we play. When we go to crunch time, it's Havlicek, it's Heinzelin, sometimes Bob Kuz, it's me. Uh, Bill Sharman when he was there. Those are the shooters that Red want the ball in their hands. And so we have plays to get all of these guys free. And so I didn't mind, I didn't mind them calling my play. 
because I knew that if we execute right, I didn't worry about a defensive man stopping me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. My first pro game was have a touch throw the ball. Is that right? I remember you running out the clock. Thank you. Right. Appreciate Turning it. the ball down. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks.